Yeah, I'm live, <laughs> but 30 minutes late. Today, tonight we're going to talk about, well, right now I'm loading a video up, a new one, and that's what I've been doing for the last hour, half hour. For some reason, I'm going to check on it right now and see if it's still going through checks. I don't know what the heck's going on. I don't know why it's taking so long to load up. I thought it would get done really quickly, and then i just transition over to the live feed, and everybody would be happy, and it would work out great. But <laughs> apparently that's not to be. But I'm here, and so hopefully people will show up and uh, we'll get things going. But tonight I want to talk about I've got a um, I got a some comments last night and an email today from one of the viewers at showing me the intake manifold that he did for his K series, which is very very cool. I like when viewers share their stuff and I can take a look at it and and hopefully when I can help them as well. So hopefully if you're here, um, take a look at the thumbnail that I have up. And this thumbnail, even more than I think the last ones that I've shown, illustrates the contraption that I made. Basically what it is is a fuel rail and the injectors are attached to the rail. So they have the little clips that hold the injector in place so that the fuel pressure cannot push the injector out. Also, as you can see, I've made a mount um, and a sliding assembly on tubes, basically. We just welded, you know, did a quickie weld thing. And what I can do is, is basically slide the injector position in and out of the opening of the radius air horn on this. I think it's a TWM intake manifold. It's a, an IR manifold for a B-series Honda engine, and I put it to good use on a, on a B60. And we ran it on a few other things, too, because we had it for a long time, and it worked very well. I have another video or we did another live feed talking about whether or not putting a common plenum on this thing turns it into a common plenum manifold and not an individual runner manifold. And the answer to that is <laughs> was both yes and no, because for a lot of people, their definition of the individual runner manifold is just that it has four blades on it because, you know, you could get the immediate response because the blades down close to the valve and yada, yada, yada. To me, that's not what an individual runner manifold is. For me, an ind individual runner manifold is a true IR manifold has no plenum. It's just open, just stacks. Like think Crower or Hillborn or, you know, the, the old uh, big block Chevy Can-Am cars, that kind of stuff. That's a, to me, that's the kind of, you know, that kind of a stack injection, whether it's a cross ram or whether it's straight up, whatever it is. To me, that's an IR. But this was a, this was an injector position test that I did. And what I wanted to do is, you can see, you probably should be able to see from the photo, and I can see, I'm going to go here and check that just to make sure. Yeah, so you can see where, if you look down below the, the steel mount that I made, there's another position for injectors, and that's normally where they are. And then there's also another position even closer to the head. So these stack injectors... Um, at least this this intake manifold position the injectors farther away from the port, which you should because that works very well, um, but not as far as I wanted to go. So what I did was go even further away, all the way out in front of it, and I took the next step in making it slide so that I could change it even that much more to see if getting it even farther away did that do anything? Did it screw up atomization? And it definitely has an effect on drivability. I can tell you that because even just taking throttle on the chassis dyno, which is, you know, arguably a fairly easy thing, you could tell that there would be drivability issues with the injectors in these positions. The farther that I put them down into the hole, the better off it was. And actually, the there were pretty big gains with most of the positions out in front of that. We could um, hurt drivability and we could hurt power when they got too far away because we could slide them out fairly far. But that position worked fairly well, but it worked really good when the injector was actually, the tip was down in past the, you know, flat plane basically of the end of the radius air horn. So down into the tube, it wasn't out, you know, far away from it. And that's what seemed to work best for the, this combination that I put together. And so my answer to the gentleman that was asking about this last night and that sent me the email is, Having the injectors, and I know because I've done this. <laughs> In fact, I have uh, live feed. I have the thumbnail for one of the live feeds with this intake manifold. And what I did was we make, when I make these intake manifolds, 
they're welded together and they're usually dual plenums, like for a V8. Sometimes, you know, it could be a single plenum for a four cylinder or a six cylinder. And what I did on one of them was I put the, I put injector bungs on the top of the plenum and we tried to run injector bungs on top of the plenum and it didn't work very well. Now I didn't try, you know, what I call nozzle injectors that are straight, you know, pencil stream, basically just a straight stream down into it and have them positionally positioned perfectly. So that it goes right into the center of the air horn and stuff. Um, I didn't try that. I just, we just tried the injectors that we had because, Hey, we're, <laughs> we're here and we're going to try it. So um, I don't know how far out the cone was, you know, how much of that of the nozzle spray was missing entirely um, on the, on the opening. Given what happens with the carburetor um, or a throttle body injection and all the things that are going on there. Obviously, none of that is aimed anywhere near directly at the port. So I kind of was hoping that it would work, but it didn't seem to work as well. But it was only one try. But I would say that I know that the IR deal with the injector down in the port worked. I know that when we went farther away from the port, it didn't work as well. And so I would guess, and maybe with a common plenum, especially on a turbo application, when you have lots of cross flow air coming in, um, that could theoretically make it even worse and maybe even make it worse um, unevenly on all the cylinders. So maybe there's more airflow past the first one that the air would come across, the first one that it would encounter, and then less and less and less. And maybe it's not bad. Maybe we're getting a bunch of reversion off of the back wall, depending on how it's designed. So you can see there's the potential for all kinds of like weirdness going on there. Uh, I would think that the injector... I know that on the Formula One stuff, when they configured their intake manifolds, they configured their intake manifolds with a fairly good size, what I would call a trough in the plenum to get the injector down near the injector placement down near the opening for their throttles. Um, so maybe that's an indication that those guys are really sharp and had tried a, ver a variety of different things um, on the on the turbo era. Obviously, a lot has been learned since then, but still you know, using that sort of information, we can kind of deduce that maybe having them on the outside of the plenum, not as great of an idea um, in terms of distribution and, and having them be problematic. Uh, I remember the injectors aimed into the plenum on the back of a Selene intake manifold back in five meter days. And that seemed to work um, okay-ish. <laughs> Although I don't know if, um, and I'm, I'm trying to think back now and remember if Kip from Turbo Magazine, if, I don't know if they ran two sets of injectors. I don't know if they ran port injectors also, or if they just changed them up to that position. And basically all eight of them would have been in a row on the back wall of the plenum on that Selene manifold. They, they already had the um, casting there, but they just had to, you know, drill the holes for all the injectors and, and secure them in place with the rail and stuff. So I don't know how well that worked. I never saw a direct test that I can remember comparing that to your normal kind of, you know, port injection on a turbo application. Because the thing is, and I think it, if I remember right, he also had an automatic trans. So getting the thing to be repeatable on the chassis dyno was pro probably an issue also. Um, I, <laughs> and God rest Kip, he, he's an awesome guy. He was the guy that gave me my start, but I remember him with his automatic bragging about how much torque the thing made on the chassis. Tent. And I'm like, dude, that's, that's converter. <laughs> the converter's doing that. It's not a manual trans. Um, but you know, that's, that's all part of the learning thing. I had, I had already back then I had already knew everything that there was to know about forced induction and automotive stuff and turbos, having never run a turbo and maybe even at that point, never even ridden or driven a turbo car, but I knew everything. I was like most people, most young people, but I digress. So the injector position I think is critical. I'll be doing some injector position testing, some more of that later on on some other applications so we'll be able to employ that. I want to try to get, you know, you know, decent power. And we see that from, um, we see that from the Honda testing and, you know, it's, it's really fairly common knowledge. Like I said, formula one's been doing it that almost every form of professional racing where that sort of stuff is allowed there, 
you know, guys know what that does. They know that the charge cooling effect and they take advantage of it because it's added power. Um, we tried to do it on one of our monobel cars and, and Tom, uh, who used to work at West is a really sharp guy. And we, he wanted to introduce stage injection. So we ran two different injector ports, but not, nothing out in front of the air horn in the plenum like that. They were just in two different um, spots along the, uh, along the runner life. And this, yeah, obviously that becomes more important the longer that the runner is. So, but if you're running a really short stack manifold and you're only running four or five inches of runner length, which is common on a lot of stuff, um, <laughs> even even changing those two positions might might be worth a little bit <laughs> but the longer the length is the more that you're going to get from that and then having the position ha having it positioned correctly obviously is, is, is going to be another issue so you want to make sure that you do that and it works out pretty well so um let's see Let's see. Dingo, I work at Perkins Engineering, Australian V8 supercars. Very, very cool stuff. Amazingly powerful combinations. In the early 90s, the dining room guy spent literally months on this. It was impressive. It is really cool because when you find out, when you do it, especially when you're working on NA motors and you are you get to the point where you're like, like when I was doing the V16 stuff, I had tried, you know, cams and ported heads and compression and, you know, and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Um, we took the damper off the balance. It wasn't a balance, it was a damper. And, and then put on the like a little aluminum hub on it, which is not a good idea. Probably. I tried 15 different headers and V pipe <laughs> extension comparisons and all kinds of stuff, you know, variable tried adjusting the cam time. We tried a bunch of different intake manifolds and, Type R stuff and P30s and ported extrude hone versions and modified versions and skunk manifolds and all kinds of stuff. And you get to the point where you're like, you know, you're you're <laughs> you're wiggling it by one or two or whatever. And you're like, man, this, it gets harder and harder. The more the more power you make, the harder each one, each new one is to get. And then when you do this thing, like with the injector position and you pick up like pretty sizable jumps in power. You're like, oh, that was really, really good. And so I could see why the Australian touring car guys were, were wanting to, the supercar guys, those are very, very cool and and amazing racing. I mean, it's just really good racing because those guys are not afraid to like <laughs> rub fenders. Carla, we were just talking about all your stuff. Uh, honestly, is decapping your fuel injectors BS or true horsepower gains? There's no horsepower gain from changing the flow rate of your injector unless your motor needs more fuel. The injector is just there to supply the fuel that the motor needs to make the power output that it can make. So whatever heads you have, whatever camshaft you have, whatever intake manifold you have, whatever displacement, if you have boost, whatever you have, you have to have enough fuel flow for that. Decapping the injectors, well, the reason that they do it is to increase the amount of fuel flow available from that injector. So it's a cheap way to get a bigger injector that could then support the other things that you want to do to it. The injector by itself, in fact, if you just decap your injectors in your stock motor, you're going to make a lot less power <laughs> because the pulse, pulse width is going to be the same from the ECU. And so now it's basically just going to drown your motor. Not to mention the fact that if you decap eight of them, six or five of them are going to be right <laughs> and the other ones are not going to be right. uh what's up 7.4 8.1 gm injector not being reliable i've never heard that i don't know what that deal is mark does the injector really have to be right in the port no it doesn't have to be right in the port could be to the side of it could be at an angle could be in front of it
Have you ever tried variable injector phasing? We've we've changed injector phasing um, with the ECU, but didn't see much power change from doing it. Uh, what size injectors would you recommend for any 572 engine? Uh, well, what if we had a 572 that wasn't even making 100 horsepower per liter or, or making uh, one horsepower per cubic inch? And what if we had one that was making three or four horsepower per cubic inch? So the injectors that you need for those would be dramatically different. Jeremy, I've modified several Jeep four liter inline six intakes, but never changed injector placement. I've increased the plenum volume to relocate the throttle body and raise the roof and taper the runners. Okay. So uh, the plenum volume change is, I've never seen big changes in power from plenum volume changes. I've made some dramatic changes in plenum volume. Um, radius in the entry into the runner, a good idea. Changing the runner length, good idea. Maybe a roof change um, or design might do something. Um, injector placement would definitely do something. Have you ever tested on a four cylinder injecting into the plenum? I don't think that I have. Only into the end of the runners. More specifically, why can the injector not be in the plenum? I didn't say it couldn't be in the plenum. It can be. What I said was that the injector, when I did it, the injector was outside the plenum, spraying from outside the plenum into the plenum and was, you know, whatever the bigness of the plenum is, whatever the dimension is, whatever the diameter is, was that far away from the opening into the port. And so when it's spraying, depending on your cone if it's a 20 degree or 50 degree or whatever it is, the cone may go out and be outside the, the opening of your runner. And so all of the fuel isn't being distributed evenly. Um, and so it can cause problems. What about a one barrel sniper? Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Matt's in the house. <laughs> I do like the one barrel sniper. And, and is that a 2.3 liter that's not even a turbo motor, right? Is it an NA version that you turbocharge? Because that's that's really awesome. <laughs> Hold my beer keg plenum, and that's it. So my theory with plenum injection is a K24, I get more fuel going to cylinders three and four, but you can do that with um, sequential injection anyway. And I've tried dual plenum four cylinders. I tried one on a B series and I wasn't very successful in changing the power output. And I tried, I, since mine was adjustable, I could change the pairing of the cylinders that I wanted. Did the plenum allow moving the throttle body gives a much better entry into the runner? Did have you tested it, Jeremy? Was it worth power? Is the Holly Sniper a good system to use on a YN Pro Charger or Turbo Engine? I don't know what you mean by sniper. Sniper is applied to a whole bunch of different things. Are you talking about the four hole throttle body? Are you talking about the fabricated sheet metal intake manifold? Are you talking about the valve covers? Are you talking about what what is it that you're trying to do? Richard, how much cleaning of piston tops do you do and how when pulling heads for replacement or rebuild? So are you replacing the pistons too? Or are you just, when when I take them out and do big bang stuff, a lot of times I will clean them. Um, sometimes I just drag a razor blade across the tops of them. Um, sometimes I'll hit them with, <laughs> we'll even hit them with a wire wheel. Um, if it's a junkyard motor, I don't spend a lot of time on that. But I will on new builds, I have like on the Engine Masters deals, um, I have uh, sanded them with finer and finer sandpaper and finally polished them. Um, mostly I was interested, this started out as 
you, you know, it's just you start out, oh, I'm just going to replace my radiator cap, and then you're rebuilding the engine. But with the pistons, it started out, I just wanted to knock the edges down for the valve release because every piston is, you know, it has sharp edges on the valve release. So I wanted to knock those down and, and radius those. And then when I had radius those, I had touched the other, you know, the outsides of that a little bit. I'm like, I may as well just do the whole piston. And then I had done it all with whatever piece of sandpaper or emery cloth that I had. I'm like, now that's all rough. And I got to at least make it a little bit nicer. And then so I used thousand or 1600 or whatever I went to in, in the successive steps. And then I finally just like, well, I'm already here. So now this thing is going to be mirror smooth. <laughs> so then I polished it. Um, Mark, that's, that's the reason that we're putting the injector in the position that we're putting it in is to get charge cooling. But spraying it willy-nilly in the plenum may or may not give you, I mean, it's going to give you charge cooling, but it may or may not give you equal distribution. So it's the same thing with water meth injection. It's the same problem. We spray a big volume of water and methanol or, or just methanol, whatever, whatever ratio you happen to be using. It could be one-sided. You're spraying a bunch of that in there, but depending on the intake design, there's no guarantee that it's all going to get in there and go to each part, each cylinder that you want it to at the right time and in the right amount. Uh, just sent you an email showing the ITB manifold, Bell Melson air box I've built for my KA24DE rally motor. I don't know if I have, let's see. Show image. So where, let's see, is there another photo? So that looks like a TWM kind of manifold, but I still don't, I don't really see where the injectors are though. I see where the rail is. Oh, they're going to go, they're going to go in those um, up where the throttle blades are. Well, that'll help. That'll be, that'll be more, um, that will be more runner length. So that will be good. Oh, I'm done with my, I'm done with my checks now. So now I can do this and go to public. And now that video is up and posted. There we go. So the new video is also up. Let's see. I went sequential injection, but I went with 160 degree injection angle. So the injects while the valve is open. My theory is it doesn't make it into the cylinder until the next cycle. It helped. Good. Good. If you if you try something and you have success, then that means it worked, right? Fresh squeezed orange juice from the tree. Holly fuel injection sniper system, good with a Hawaiian Pro Charger or turbo engine. Dual plenum isn't like a V8 dual plenum. It's referenced to 80s Audi style plenums, two plenums in a row. I've seen that done on V6 or on inline six cylinders, but not on a four cylinder. Size intercooler pipe would you use on twin GT45s on a big block? I would use three inch probably. Might go even bigger if you have a. The thing that I'd be concerned with is what's going into the intercoolers. Are are you using how big is the inlet going into the intercooler? You have intercoolers that would be three and a half, uh, and a four out like the one that we use for the big bang deal. But if they're three and a half in and three and a half out, then I would use that. Cleaning pistons in a block. So all mechanical, no chemical. No, I spray brake clean on it. Um, I, I'm not afraid to do anything in there because then we just blow it out with an air compressor. Do you scrape and sand them in the block? I have before on, like I said, on junkyard motors, I do that. All right, Marco, take care of man.
Uh, Nathan, there's not going to be one that, one of those that's better than the other. As long as your drivers can handle a low impedance injector, you can use those. A lot of times the choice becomes uh, injector sizing. A lot of times the smaller injectors, and by smaller, I mean something that's an 80 <laughs> or an 800 cc or an 80 pound injector and below is kind of a, that, that seems to be the high impedance and stuff. And then the low impedance stuff is up beyond that. So your choice is going to be more about what size injector I'm going to use, and then also make sure make sure that, that your ECU can do that. A lot of the aftermarket stuff can, so it's not a problem. Uh, Vince, yeah, my my wife likes the um, the flavored stuff. Uh, Frank, I've seen the, the 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 Formula One guys went to a reverse um, spray. They have a lot of um, uh, airspeed coming in, and that they got good distribution that way, and they got good power. Fuel injection or carb for an LS swap? What would be a better choice? Um, it depends on what you're getting. Are you buying the whole thing as a fuel injected motor? That works good. If you're getting part of it and you don't want to do, you know, if you just want to put the MSD or Edelbrock, you know, ignition controller on there, it's pretty easy to put a carburetor on there. The for for a cathedral port LS, the carbureted intake manifolds are not as good as the fuel injected manifolds. The fuel injected manifolds can make more power, much more average power, certainly. Um, so that's something to consider, but then you have to be able to program all the stuff if you make modifications to it and don't run it stock. Uh, number one, you can you clean it how how you want to. <laughs> I spin the motor over a couple of times after we've cleaned it and blowed it out, and then I wipe it and wipe it and wipe it. And you know we try to get most of it out. Quite honestly, if it's a junkyard motor, it, it has stuff in there anyway. If you look at the tops of the pistons, that stuff comes off. What do you think about direct port meth systems on a blower LS? I think it's a good idea. I think it's a much better idea than just blowing it into the throttle body. I think you get much better distribution. I don't think it works as well as an intercooler, though. What are your thoughts on the Elbrock ProFlow 4 EFI system? I don't know about the EFI system. I've run the ProFlow intake manifolds, but I've never tuned with that EFI. Uh, Jeff, they do have a distributor for the LS motors too. That's for me. I think that's a giant waste of time compared to having a, a simple controller that plugs into all the factory coil packs and and crank and cam sensors and stuff. It's just so easy. Uh, Snafu, I don't know the answer to any of those questions. Any ideas on the easiest way to hot rod a 4.3 liter V6? Yeah, there's a there's boost. Torxor makes a small block Chevy kit, so it bolts right onto a 4.3 liter V6. So you can have a blow through deal on there. You could use a blow through carburetor on that. It works good. There are you could port the heads. There are camshafts available for it. There are carbureted intake manifolds. All that stuff's available for the 4.3 liter. The 4.3 liter was available with different things, Dan. It was available as a port injected motor and a throttle body injected motor, right? Overbuilt here.
do you have any FE heads or intake? No, I, I've never run one of those on the dyno other than being there when Robert Pond was running an aluminum one. You know, Astro van. That's where I got mine out of was in a van. The um, pulling it out of the van is much different than pulling it out of the um, pulling it out of the truck. It's a lot easier out of a truck. Apparently there's a 4.3 direct, direct injection. Um, yeah, if you take a look at the video that I just posted, I ran a dyno test on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, two videos on it, one with a cam upgrade, and then the other one we compared to the other 4.3s. But the new LT motor, the LT-based LV1 and LV3 are both direct injected motors. They're based on the LT architecture, but they're 4.3 meter V6s. Lives in the house. Okay, Liv, tell us, when, when, when is that sprint coming out? You know, Dan, I'm told people that that, that goofy spider injection, more on the, not on the V6s so much, I think, that they were talking about more on the V8s, on the, um, like the uh, L31, I think, is the, the small block with the Vortec heads, that there are ways to get more fuel flow out of those and that guys can run boost on them. Can I bless my 3800 MAF sensor with alcohol while, <laughs> while it's running? Yeah, see what happens. Um, back in the day, they used to run nitrous across the mass air meter and get it to um, get it to add fuel because <laughs> it was really, really cold. Uh, Foreign's in the house. The updated setup places the injectors at the port instead of just the poppet. So are they, but aren't, aren't they still running the spider injection? At least that's the information I was given. I know if we went to a port injection deal that that would work, but I thought that they were doing something to the, um, to the spider injection. L31s had an updated injector that got rid of the poppet nozzles and went with a regular mini injector under the plenum. Okay, the V6s use the same. looks like the spider, but it has wires to injectors. Okay. So do we just need to get more injector flow then? Can they, do they have bigger injectors? Uh, Larry, we, we see the poll request. So <laughs> just relax. Everybody sees you. You're not invisible. Overbuilt, you're going to call it, call it a homogenizer. Isn't that what, um, that's what Smokey was calling his, right? He superheated the fuel and then use a turbo to homogenize it and got power gains. I haven't read the whole story. So, I mean, obviously he's a legend and knew, and knew what he was doing, but it sounds a little bit. Mohammed, would you think it's worth doing a direct meth on a setup running a meth injection on 100% E85? I don't know how much more you're going to get. Um, and the other thing that the other thing I don't like about having a direct port injection for a water meth setup is that you're limiting the amount of cooling that you're getting. So you're, you're getting E85, so you're getting charge cooling going into the chamber but you're not getting charge cooling of the air coming into the intake manifold. That's the nice thing about a water meth injection um, or an intercooler that cools the air going in. Um, and then you get secondary cooling from whatever you're injecting, either it's gasoline or E85, or if you're running methanol and it's a race car, you obviously get that as well. Um, so doing a direct port down where the injector is, <laughs> that's gonna be of less benefit, I would argue. Um, although you should have lower EGTs maybe and, and reduce the chance of detonation.
Uh, Tony, I didn't see your comment. No, there's no there's no limitation on what you can ask. You can ask whatever you want. Lubbock, Texas is in the house. Two pounds of boost, low boost, acting more like an air vein mixer, but two pounds of positive pressure is still a lot of power. Uh, Liv, I only have one aluminum block right now, and that's the L33, but we're still using that for a bunch of testing. But I think that the trophy four cylinder might have arrived. <laughs> I put a call on my boy Troy um, at Westec, but he's not there right now. He's gone. I got a Mustang Cobra 2. Very nice. I hope it has the uh, Cobra thing on the hood, which is awesome. It's like the Cobra version of the Trans Am Thunder Chicken. Uh, build the 302 or go LS swap for serious carnival ride. Um, the, either of those work. The An aluminum LS in there would be kind of cool. Uh, Richard, with two stages of injection, it'd be interesting to know what's the point of diminishing return in terms of volume in secondaries. <laughs> Benicia, California, check it in. You're right up the road. Abilene, Texas. Power and supercharger on a stock box leader. Yeah, yeah, that works good. In fact, the next video that I do on the... Because the video that I just put up is about... I, got, I get a lot of questions about people that were curious about changing displacement of your motor without changing the other things. Like, okay, if you have a stock motor, what happens if you just add displacement to it? So you keep the same heads and cam and intake manifold and all that stuff. What happens if I just put a stroker version of whatever that motor is? So I have two examples in the video. One is very, very simple. I can compare a stock 4.8 to a stock 5.3 because essentially... A 5.3 is a stroker version of the 4.8. They share the same block. They share the same bore size. The, the change really is the stroke. They also share the same heads and cam and intake manifold. So all of that works out very well. So it's easy to demonstrate what happens because they have all the same components. That's essentially a stroker version. I also did another one on a 302, on a 302 Ford. So we ran a 302 with the stock E7TE heads, the stock HO camshaft, and in this case, I ran a GT40 intake manifold on it, although I had run the 302 with the HO manifold on it. But when I ran the 347 for another test, I didn't ever run the stock HO manifold. I only ran the GT40. We started with that because it, already, it was already available. And then we, maybe we didn't have an HO manifold or maybe I didn't care about it. Um, but So we have a good comparison between running and, and who else would do that? I mean, who would take a 347 and saddle it with a stock camshaft and stock cylinder heads? We at least put a, a reasonable looking like intake manifold on it in the form of GT40 and a 65 millimeter throttle body. So we ran the, the you know, stock displacement and the stroker version of the 302 and then the stock displacement and the stroker version of the 4.8 liter. And I showed you both the curves to see what happens to the power curves. It's fairly interesting to see what happens when we go up in displacement when we're limiting it by something, either head flow or intake manifold or camshaft or, or all of the above. And and the when I started to go off on that tangent, I, we also ran them with superchargers. So, so that will be coming up. We ran the stock one. Uh, yeah, yeah, foreign is, is down in that area. Uh, Possum Kingdom, Texas, nice. We have um, we have possums here too, and we also have uh, skunks that meander aimlessly out, out at night. So I've got a 93 Grand Marquis Ford, a 4.6 liter. That's a two valve motor. And I want to supercharge it, but every kit says 96 something. Is there a reason I can't slap one on my 93? If it's a 462 valve, there are kits for that 462 valve. Again, a 93 should be. I don't think that a Grand Marquis is a four valve motor in 93. Um, so it's probably a two valve, and it's a not non, it's going to be a non-PI two valve also, I think, in that combination. 
if I remember right. Somebody somebody might chime in here and tell me what that is, but that's what I think it is. And if it is, there are blower kits that would work. The thing is, I don't know about it fitting exactly in that chassis. Um, they will definitely work on the motor. Steven, why do the horsepower curves have the same color on the dyno charts? Unfortunately, the version that I have, the run viewer version that I have, um, does not cooperate with Windows 10, which is what I have on my computer. And so I could only do that at West Tech. It will not allow me to change to select colors. Whatever color I select is the color for everything. There is a drop down menu that says, hey, color is the test. And if you click on that, nothing happens. It used to work, and now it does not. West Sachs in the house. That's up by uh, Todd. Uh, Liv, so you want to go check out junkyards? Uh, you know, I'm always down for that. <laughs> Atomically speaking. Central California, Manteca. I drive drive through there all the time. Uh, Colton, Richard, didn't know if I was so close to everyone. Free drink. Yeah, we could meet over with um, with Oliver the, with the Nova. How much horsepower do you think a fuel system consisting of the following could support? Hellcat lift pump. I'm not real familiar on Hellcat pumps. It's a surge with dual Hellcat pumps feeding eight 220 cc injectors. Um, that would feed more than that K24 would ever make. I don't know about the, the injector size, if you have eight of those, is is bordering on the ridiculous unless you're running, I, I hope you're running methanol with this. Um, the thing that I don't know about is if the dual Hellcat pumps are enough to feed what those injectors will flow. Probably not, but you have lots and lots. The, the nice thing though, is that you have lots and lots of injector. So even if you, even if your fuel pressure falls off, <laughs> which will increase the flow rate of the pump, you still have enough duty cycle in the injector to play with. So, cause that's a lot of power. So let's see. So the, in <laughs> the injectors will, on an NA motor, the injectors will support 3,500 horsepower. <laughs> so 0.75. So they'll support let's say that they'll support 2600 horsepower uh under boost with the 85 so a lot salvador does intake runner like make a turbo spool up faster long runner and short runner etc yes it does anything that changes the power output of the naturally aspirated motor especially at low RPM, improves the spool up of the turbo. Longer runners are going to make a turbo spool up quicker than short runners will. Same thing with camshafts. A smaller camshaft that's more responsive down low, going to help the turbo spool better. Bigger turbos are not going to spool as fast. Salvador, do you have the 3800? 
Have you done any testing with fuel injection timing? We have. Um, we have varied injection timing on the dyno, and I can't remember now. It, I'm sure that it was on an LS. I'm almost sure it was. We didn't see much power from it. But that's one application. That's one time on one application. So that's obviously nowhere near universal. <laughs> so, so I guess we could have a poll, right? <laughs> Okay, so the poll for tonight is, is should Richard have a poll? Uh, uh, a NorCal meetup, that would be good. Uh, maybe Dan could hook us hook up with us too. Uh, Tony, a lot of guys misuse area under the curve, but <laughs> for me, what area under the curve means is that, and I, when I do these dyno, uh, presentations, when I supply you the whole curve and I, and I give you the whole curve, a lot of times the area under the curve for a lot of these guys means like power before the torque peak. When you're trying to accelerate a car, you look at the horsepower peak and the torque peak, and that's kind of the range that you accelerate in. A lot of times it will be past the torque peak, actually, and then on either side of the horsepower peak. And for a lot of guys, area under the curve means the lower part of the curve. But I supply the whole curve, so you see all of it. Salvador, you do have a 3800. Um, so if you are doing the inserts in the factory manifolds, if it's an NA manifold, um, that will shorten the runner length because you're taking out the section of the runner length. I want RPM turbo response for 7,000 feet elevation. Then you want a long runner manifold. Can we see an old 403 versus a Pontiac 400? That would be kind of cool. I don't think that the Oldsmobile would do very well, but maybe it would. Overbuilt, I have a 4.7 liter engine. Well, the whole car. Uh, 84 924S. Ooh, nice. I, I like those. 306 horsepower gray market engine not run in 20 years. Perfect. It's right up my alley. Um, they hooked up the battery backwards. Story goes. Say this may be a dyno test. That would be cool. A, a, a 928 motor would be cool. The only thing I don't know about is what does the bell housing look like? Because I know that those were transactional cars. So maybe it has a, a easy bell housing that would bolt right up to something. But then we'd also need to figure out what the crank trigger is and stuff, what the crank and cam trigger are. Because that's not a, the nice thing is that that's from the 80s. So it's not a variable cam car. Uh, anyone know of any rotary guys that do live streams? Does does Rob do live streams? He he might. And he, he's the only rotary guy I know. Uh, Tony, I forgot already what year your car is. Oh, on your 93, right? Um, 93 is not an OBD2 car, right? It shouldn't be. You, There probably are programmers for that, um, for that car. Uh, I'm trying to think who has... Who has software for that? I, 
I, Dan, I think that they're talking about um, the not the curve for the camshaft, but the power curve. Uh, Trevor, there are a lot of things that affect the shape of the curve after the power peak. The intake runner length, the cam timing, the head flow, the displacement, valve train. Uh, these cars use Bosch, LH electronic fuel injection system, purely electronic Bosch ignition. Mike, I've never run the Fitech uh, EFI system. I think that Eric and Ish have probably run those on somebody else's motor at West Tech, but I never have. Oh, cool. Overbuilt. It's a, it's a manual car too. That, that is very cool. So I have, if we take a look here, where is, I was just looking at this the other night. My Pontiac books. So I'm looking for my, I was just looking through all of the Porsche 928 books that I have. I don't know, I'll have to find it later. Okay, replace a hydraulic lifter with a solid and not change the cam. No, the ramp rate on the cam is probably not going to be right. I think isn't too bad to deal with. Uh, I had a 442 for another shop. I, I mean, all of the fuel injections, once you learn them, it's just manipulating the air fuel and the timing. It's not really that difficult. Tony, you're welcome, man. Go tell like about a million of your friends and they'll be able, they'll come in. <laughs> Micro squirt, mega squirt, Commodore 64. Commodore 32. No, uh, oh, Mark, so you just saw the photo that I posted. Starter fried. We don't need a starter for the dyno. So Illinois, we don't care about that. The batteries hooked up backwards. It'd probably zap the ECU too, right? So, but that's okay. We would just hook up uh, our standalone. The only thing is hopefully it didn't hurt. Does it have coil packs on it? I don't know what the, I would imagine it does, right? Oh, the Panther cars, Tony. HRA stock eliminator cars run solid lifters on hydraulic cams. You, you didn't put the, <laughs> you, you also needed the air quotes on the hydraulic cam. 3800 supercharged and an S10 blazer. That would be an excellent choice. And especially if it's, um, you should do a 3800 turbo though. It'd be even better.
person on 28 have variable timing due to the extremely long timing belts. They can't be any longer than uh, like a modular Ford, right? Over-engineered tensioners. I can believe that about a Porsche or a Volkswagen or an Audi. Racer, I ran the Phytech 600 horsepower unit on the dyno and on cars. It worked very well, but engine dyno time was a waste of time. The self-tuning only tunes at three RPM spots, really? And does it interpolate between those three spots? That seems like a not very efficient system. Why wouldn't it just respond to the O2 reading at every RPM and load? Thirty-eight hundred turbo. Yeah, you could get a blower one. They they just come from the from the wrecking yard like that. No lash ramp on the hydros. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, of camming my uh, K24 and still having great fuel economy. You already know what the answer is. Just just cam the VTEC lobes then. Uh, I've never tried a Speedwino ECU. I do have a MS3 Pro that we're running the 4200 with, though. So how is our poll doing? Should Richard have a poll? It's 21% still saying no. At 21%. Overbuilt, you have a distributor? Tony, stock Fox 5 liter, what's your first upgrade? Gears. Most guys would do gears on that because a lot of the Mustangs had, um, if, it, if it was a stick car, um, you, we had 308s or 273s. Mine was a 308 car because I, I sele selected that gear when I bought my car because I bought it new. And, but most of them were 273s, so gears would make a big difference on a 5-liter car. And then after that, most people would put um, exhaust on them. they do underdrive pulleys, you know, K&N, all the kind of normal stuff. It's been a long time since I saw, saw a stock box body. Tony, I don't know about the stock Miata. I don't know about the ECU on that. I don't know if people have gotten into that. Uh, somebody else here might know. I know that Greddy and those guys had kits for them, but I don't know what they were doing with the uh, um, fuel management. A 390 in a Fox. One more minute. And make sure to go check out the video that I just posted while we were on the live on the live feed. So I'm going to go ahead and close out our poll, or not a poll. I, I'm a big fan. I, although I like the um, 920 S4s, um, I like the intake manifolds on those. Cleveland in a Fox body. Cleveland's are good. Or a Barra or aluminum LS. When are you going to drop a turbo engine in a roadkill car? I'm not part of a roadkill. That's, that's not my thing. Best budget heads for torque on a 5.3. The ones that came with the 5.3 are the best ones. The Taurus SHO did was cool looking. Those intakes were very cool. Three 
390 would lift a tire. I'm like, I <laughs> could hop a Coke can, as they say. Larry, the poles are the best part. I thought that I thought that that was me. <laughs> Apparently not, based on the poles, right? I I plan on doing a T. I, I do plan on doing a 390 on the engine dyno of some kind. It might be a stock one. <laughs> Nothing outperforms the LS4 intake manifold. That's right. LS4. LS9 cam, what was somebody saying last night? LS4 intake, LS9 cam, 317 heads. I think they even, uh, maybe it wasn't the LS9 cam. Maybe it was the cam from the early six liter or something. The FE that I'm going to dyno belongs to my son's old soccer coach. He has two of them, and one of them is supposed to be a running FE is the only thing that I know about on it. I think that the trophy is either here or will be here tomorrow. Nothing beats the Yugo intake. I would want to test one of those. Find some old Super Cobra heads for that FE Fox. I don't think that those really go together, right? And FE wasn't a Super Cobra jet. That'd have to be a 429. I, I've had nothing but good luck with log manifolds. I was asking about those, and they always make good power. This is a poll better than Richard. We already know the answer to that. Yeah, Foreign, do you have any Yugos over there at your place? Next, uh, next life, people are going to get yelled at. Not really. That's in twin age. I think um, I, I was talking to uh, Oliver about putting the 8.1 in the in the Nova, which would be good. But it would, you know, it can't be stock though. It would need boost at least, right? Okay, guys, I gotta get going. Thank you guys all for showing up. Sorry I was late, but make sure to go check out the video. It's up now, so you can go right from here to making comments, making snide comments about the the video. So I will see you guys all tomorrow. And we're ending and, and we're clicking and